Hey everyone, hope you're having a great Friday. Um, it's that time for the weekly compilation video to go over what we've been talking about this week. And this week we have been discussing uh, Flabanserin or Addy in detail. Um, Flabanserin is one of two FDA approved medications for the treatment of hypoactive sexual desire disorder in uh, premenopausal women. Um, I'll talk about the other one sometime here in the future, but this week we're really gonna be focusing on just this drug by itself. Now, historically, all of this came about really starting in the late 1990s with the advent of a medication called sildenafil. And sildenafil was originally developed for the treatment of pulmonary hypertension. But in study participants, when they were using that drug, they found, hey, this helps men get erections. So let's market it to that population because that's a lot more important, apparently. Um, so now um, you can go and buy Viagra. Um, you can get it from a pharmacy and some places you can get it just on the internet or at, you know, without a prescription. So it's really kind of revolutionized the way that we've thought about um, sexual function and dysfunction in terms of medical treatments. Now, it really kind of plays into the idea or this feeling of, of um, inequity in terms of male sexual medicine and female sexual medicine. You think about it, there are commercials all the time for Viagra or Cialis or, um, you know, a lot of the other um, type of, of uh, medications for erectile dysfunction. And honestly, it's really interesting, too, because prior to the advent of Viagra, we used to call that impotence. And that sounds really bad. And so this also started this kind of nomenclature change to make this something that was more socially acceptable, something that, uh, you know, in this case, men would feel comfortable talking to their doctors about saying, hey, you know, one out of every three men have erectile dysfunction. Um, it sounds like a medical condition, not that I'm not powerful. So what can you do to help me? And they say, ah, try this pill. Here you go. Go have an erection. So, you know, when this happened, obviously there was a kind of a discussion in the women's health world saying, okay, well, what about us? We want to have, you know, better sex too. And really at the time there wasn't a whole lot of options, you know, and really for women's health medication in general, it's focused on either keeping you from getting pregnant or treating some sort of infection, or when you're menopausal, making sure that you're not having hot flashes and night sweats and stuff like that. You know, there's really very little pharmacologic space that is dedicated to female sexual functioning. And, and this is a big issue. You know, honestly, I think this, and this is just me going on a soapbox, this is not just an issue about, you know, medication. This gets really boils down to reproductive rights and honestly, like just basic human rights. Like you have the right to have a good and healthy sex life. Like, you know, it, it's not okay that average Joe Blow down the street can literally get online to some pharmacy and, and wherever and get this medication and you can't. There are doctors out there today, healthcare providers that don't, have never heard of phlebanthrin. They've never heard of any of these other medications. And so they just tell their patients, well, grant and bear it, you're gonna have to deal with it. Welcome to your new new. Oh, go drink some wine, just kind of push through it. This horrible talk that doesn't make any sense in the scheme of things. You know, if you think about it, we don't tell people who are having a heart attack, well, just go have more heart attacks and you'll get through it. Or, well, you had a stroke, sorry, that's just how it's gonna be. You know, or in the case of erectile dysfunction, well, sorry, you're just gonna have to live with it. Like, no, there's treatments for that. Why are there not treatments for these same type of things in the women's health sector? So anyway, that that's my soapbox, you know. So anyway, so, okay. Moving on. So that was kind of the history. Basically, jumping forward into the mid 2000s and teens, um, the FDA approved the uh, use of a, a medication called flibanserin, um, or what would become to known or be known as Addy, for the treatment of hypoactive sexual desire disorder in premenopausal women. Once again, why premenopausal? Well, because it's the FDA has divided women's health medications into separate categories based on your age. This is stupid, like it really is. Estrogen is estrogen, testosterone is testosterone. Like insulin is insulin. It's not men-selin and women-selin. There's not like an FDA approved form for men with diabetes and with women with diabetes. Like why the heck are medications just, well, you're for premenopausal and you're for postmenopausal. Like there doesn't need to be this breakdown. The hormones are the same folks. Like. Get it through your head, not you, but people in the FDA, if you're listening, please. It's the same mechanism. The receptors are the same. The only thing that's different is that someone has gone more trips around the sun than somebody else. Like, that's really all that there is to this. So, anyway, 
Okay, wow, too many soapboxes. So um, anyway, flavanserin was approved for the treatment of hypoactive sexual desire disorder um, in premenopausal women. HSDD is the most common type of sexual dysfunction we see in um, women. And remember that roughly 40% of women across the United States will experience some form of sexual concern in their life. And that's more than the total number of men, women, and children with all types of diabetes combined. So this is huge. And so, you know, it was revolutionary. It was an amazing medication. By golly, we can help women who don't want to have sex. Now they will want to have sex. The problem is when you look at endpoint data, the thing that the media chose to focus on was these things called sexu satisfying sexual events or SSEs. They said, well, it's not really increasing the number of times people are wanting to have sex. And they said it's not really doing that more than placebo, so it's not really effective. That's not what this is about. This is about your desire to engage in that intimate connection with somebody or yourself or whoever. This is about feeling that desire. There, there's not a medication that can make you go and have sex, you know, more times. Like I said in a previous story this week, you know, the kids could walk in or your in-laws could call or whatever. Like there's nothing that can make you have more sex, but what we can do with this medication is help your desire to have that go up. And that's really what they found. And that's you know why this medication is so effective because for the people that, who respond really well to it, like they do notice that. They say, you know what? Now I'm thinking about sexual activity. I, I you know, I'm daydreaming about it. I'm having erotic dreams. And a lot of times the sex they have is better and you know it's something that they look forward to and this is game changing for a lot of people so um you know, the other thing that when Flabanser was first released, there was this thing called the REMS protocol that you had to do, which basically a patient had to sign saying they've promised solemnly and sworn to not drink alcohol while taking this medication. Once again, this came from a very flawed study in the in the you know basics, uh, kind of going through the the FDA approve or um, approval process, basically saying, okay, if you're going to drink alcohol, what is this going to do? And so they took people who drank alcohol um, on an empty stomach, and they had them drink it quickly, and they had them take Addy the night before, and they said, okay, what are you going to? How do you feel? And people said, man, I feel like I'm going to pass out. They said, ah, the Addy makes people want to pass out if they drink alcohol. Never mind if they were drinking alcohol on an empty stomach and basically slamming it back. So thankfully that has gotten taken off. So, you know, now there's just kind of this, this understanding or, or a discussion to have with patients. Hey, if you drink more than, than three drinks a night, don't take your Addy that night. You can skip it. You know, more than three, skip your Addy. So anyway, um, the other thing that they saw with it, you know, or what the medication, one of the main side effects is it makes you really sleepy. So this is a medication you want to take right before you go to bed. You know, um, one of my colleagues said this is a nightstand medication. You know, you take your Addy, turn off the light, boop, go to bed. Enjoy a good night's sleep. And hopefully you have better sex too. Um, and in some of the new studies that are coming out, they're seeing a decrease in sexual pain as well as in weight loss. So, I mean, really, this is a fantastic medication with very, very, very few side effects. Um, we give it about an eight-week uh, trial to see if it works. If it does work, great. If it doesn't work, okay, that's fine. You know, you stop it. So it's not like a medication where you have to say, okay, be on it now for six months and let's reassess. No, you basically have two months worth of, of seeing if it works before you can say, yes, it does or no, it doesn't. But the truth is a lot of patients experience an improvement in their symptoms prior to that two month mark. So there you go for that too. Now, as I put in my little story yesterday, who else can take Addy? Can, can men, can postmenopausal women? The answer is obviously yes. Um, it's just that it's considered an off-label use. So, you know, insurance most likely won't pay for it. Um, and because of, of that, and some insurance companies are still silly and won't, aren't paying for it, you know, they have a lot of prescription assistant program, assistance programs that you can um, get, get into. So um, with some of the pharmacies we've checked with, you know, a three month supply will cost you around $199, which is very reasonable and can basically thinking, you know, that's three months for 200 bucks. You know, if you get a, you know, Frappuccino or something every day for five to six bucks, you know, that's a hundred and, and, you know, $80 in one month that you're just spending on coffee alone. So there you go. Um, 
I had a patient or I had, excuse me, someone send out me a message yesterday, you know, can I take Addy with other antidepressants? And I had mentioned in a previous video that um, this was originally developed as an antidepressant. And really what they found is that, hey, this really had a, a you know, boon to sexual desire. Um, the reason that uh, it works that way, or it was originally trialed as an antidepressant, is because it works on serotonin and uh, dopamine receptors in your brain. Remember that with your sex drive, serotonin is sexually inhibitory, it kind of puts on the brakes. Dopamine is excitatory, it kind of puts this, you know, pushes the gas down. So people who have HSDD, it's like they're trying to drive with their parking brake on. You know, they have a really hard time kind of starting to go. Once they're driving, you can still drive and still, you know, do your sexual driving or whatever it may be, but it's that initial start that takes a, you know, a lot and a lot of effort. So Addy basically boop, takes off the parking brake. But basically in terms of using it with other antidepressants, Yes, there's one basically Luvox or Fluvoxamine that you really don't want to use it with, but for the most part, um, you can use it with other antidepressants as well. Um, other medications, things that inhibit or kind of activate on the cytochrome P450 system in your liver. Um, there's a very short list of these. So if you are on a lot of medications, I would advise you to talk with your healthcare provider about this and, and you're trying to see if Addy's right for you because the, um, you know, we have on the healthcare provider website kind of a list of, of medications that it interacts with. So. Um, otherwise, you know, that's really it. Like I said, you know, it's a fantastic medication. It's been around now since, you know, really 2000, um, you know, the, or the mid uh, 2010s. Um, and uh, thankfully, kind of, it's gone through some iterations with different drug companies, but Sprout, the company that um, kind of is, is distributing it now, um, was with it from the very beginning. So, and I've um, had the privilege of being able to be a, a speaker with them um, because I'm very passionate about this medication, if you can't tell. Um, you know, a lot of people kind of say, oh, you know, doctors that, that give drug talks, they're bought out by the pharmaceutical industry. Um, you know, as a sexual medicine provider, the, you know, number of drugs I have for women's sexual health is very limited. I've got, like I said, two for HSDD specifically that are FDA approved. I have testosterone as well, but that's not FDA approved for women. That's a whole nother story. But you know, I have been involved with the use of both, or been involved with both Addy and uh, Vilesi. You know, I believe in them 100% and I prescribe them and I have no problem trying to educate other physicians about them because there's just not enough of me or people like me to go around. You know, we have to be teaching this to newer generations of healthcare providers. This has to be taught in med school and nursing school and PA school and all those things, so. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed um, our talk this week. You know, I've um, this was in collaboration with Tara Thompson at the Sexual Health Pharmacist, so make sure you check out her site. Next week, I'm going to be talking about lichen sclerosis in detail um, in, collection, in connection with the Lost Labia Chronicles. So, yep, yeah, it'll be a great time. We're going to really delve deep into LS. So, um, I'm Corey Babb. Take charge of your own health, and I'll see you next week.